we're going to review the whole chapter from verse on and then we'll go from there and I forgot my glasses so I won't be able to see very well tonight these are glasses but they're not the ones I preach from all right chapter 1 of Luke what does Luke mean what is the full name of Luke Lucifer Lucifer which means a light carrier or brilliant one or shining one and Lucifer is not a bad name but everybody named Luke is Lucifer actually today verses 1 through 4 is an introduction by Luke to Theophilus and Theophilus was what kind of a person was Theophilus like a knight a very, high, a very high, high royal person so we see that in, in the Greek especially it's most excellent Theophilus but it's Sir Theophilus Th Sir Theophilus or master or most renowned Theophilus and then I want to make a correction in the King James and everybody else followed King James there's a problem here. You know what that problem is, uh, Sharon? No. Huh? Nope. Marilyn, do you know what that problem is here? Verse number five on. Five. What is the problem? Do you remember what the problem here is? Vincent, do you remember the problem? No, I don't. Oh, the Zacharias and Zacharias. It's not Zacharias. It's Zachariah. His name is Zachariah. Yes, it's not Zacharias. That King James uh, had a lot of problems with names. Uh, they they m messed up the names from the Old Testament to, new, to the New Testament. This is not Zacharias. This is Zachariah. It has it in the center called Zachariah. The, the correct one. Yeah, Zachariah is the way you spell it. Of course, Jesus is Joshua, or Joshua, actually. There's a lot of discrepancy in the names from the King James and the other ones follow suit because they don't want to go too far from King Jim but Zechariah and and God appears to Zechariah in the temple and up here in this tabernacle now this is the temple but Zechariah goes in to burn incense on the altar of incense in the temple and he looks over there to the right side of that altar of incense and what's standing there? Sharon, what's standing there? Uh, Gabriel. Gabriel standing there. Gabriel. What does Gabriel mean? God is huh? God is great and God is yeah. powerful. All right. And he appears to him and tells him that his wife is going to get pregnant and he's going to be a father. And uh, then Zechariah said, How do I know that this is going to be so? And just like Abraham and Sarah did in the Old Testament, he corrects him somewhat. Except here, he stops him from being able to speak. He can't talk. So when he gets out and he goes outside, they're wondering what happened to them. He's, they think he has seen a vision, and when he comes out, he cannot speak. And I want you to pay close attention to this, Brother Ray. He starts talking in sign language. That's what it says in the Greek. He starts talking in sign language, trying to make himself known by sign language. And uh, what other great obstacle or what we call exception to the rule happened here, Sharon? You remember? Oh, because he uh, normally, if a priest was infirm in any way, he would have been sent home, someone would have sent him home. home. But <clears throat> because they knew that God, that, that it, you know, it was a holy thing that happened to yeah, him. Yeah, something happened to now. Sharon is a little bit away from the microphone here but normally when a priest if he had a stroke or if he fell down and 
cut himself or whatever might have happened to him where he was infirm, they'd send him home. He could not finish out his duty. But Zechariah, when he... Now, how did they know that he didn't have a stroke and just couldn't talk anymore? Because something happened here. There's something supernatural happening here. So they are going to allow him to go ahead and finish his priestly duties. Did you catch that one before, Brother A? Yeah, pretty much. All that yeah. Happened. Something happened to Zechariah. Yeah. He should have been sent home, but he wasn't. He wants to send home because they thought that he had a vision. And so they're great, advanced in, in age and everything. And it says, and according to the custom of the priesthood, also he had chosen by lot to enter the temple of the, at the, of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the burning of incense. And that's in verse number 10, 9 and Nine and ten in chapter one, and he tells him what the child's name is going to be. It's going to be Awana, or John, or Dove, or Gentle One. Now was Jonah gentle? Jonah wasn't gentle, was he? He preached hell, fire, and damnation. How about John the Baptist? Was he a gentle soul, brother Vincent? Oh, no. <laughs> no, not at all. Yeah. Hell, fire, and damnation. He has to, though. You brood of vipers. Who sent you or who called you or, or calls you to come to the light of the Lord? Come to the repentance. You brood of the devil. So, this boy's name is going to be John. He won him. And uh, you will have joy and gladness, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Why, what kind of a, a right or what's going on here? He will drink no liquor or wine, and he won't cut his hair. What's this about, Brother Ray? Talking about the law of the Nazarites. The Nazarite. Okay. Now, Nazareth and Nazarite. Now, since I'm here, maybe I can find a pen. That's ground, terra firma. Believe it or not, that's a tree. Okay? Now, a tree has limbs above and limbs below, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. These roots, and if you go out here, the roots are probably about the same distance as the limbs are. Did you know that? That's what they say if you're going to fertilize them or whatever you're going to do, go out this far and start going back as far as the limbs are. Now, the prophecy said that Jesus would be a root out of dry ground. And Natsar or Nazareth means root, doesn't it? But it also means to divide and separate. See? Divide. Divide and separate. Limbs separate and divide there. And so the word Nazarite means to, to separate. They're separate. Now, the Nazarite was a voluntary priest. Did you know that? He was not of the order of the priest or anything many times, but he was a volunteer priest and that he did everything that the priests were supposed to do when they were on duty. When the priests were on duty, could they drink wine? No. When the priests were on duty, could they eat grape juice? When the priests, priests were on duty, could they run home real fast and kiss their wives? No. No, none of these things. So the Nazarite was a voluntary priest. He voluntarily took that, and we find even in the New Testament, we see Paul going back and making an offering uh, for the, the right of the Nazarites. When you went back and you gave an offering, then you were free from uh, being like a Nazarite, being a Nazarite. And John the Baptist would be a Nazarite from his mother's womb. He would also have the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. 
he would also be involved by the Holy Spirit of God and he would be a special birth, unusual birth. The only one like that as far as we know. The only one like him. So there's some special things about him and, and, and John the Baptist was the greatest prophet, wasn't he? He's the greatest prophet of all time. Yet he would be what? Least in the kingdom of God. Why will be he least in the kingdom of God, Brother Ray? Because he was a left link, but he was a member of the church itself. But something else more important than that. Uh, uh, he was the Old Testament. Why was he least in the kingdom of God? I would imagine he Did was John the Baptist have volition? Well, not as far as salvation. No. So do you think that might have been what made him least in the kingdom of God? Because he did not have to repent and do this? That God, he was born that way? This is unusual, isn't it? This is not normal. Not normal. The Bible says, and it is pointed unto man once to die, and after that to judgment. Tell me a man in the Bible that died twice. Lazarus? Maybe Lazarus, but we have one absolute one that died twice. Who was that? Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle was stoned to death. According to Second Corinthians, he went up into the third heaven and saw things that were not even able to be spoken about in human language. And not permitted. And God put him back in his body, and then he got his head chopped off later on. So he died twice, didn't he? He got to be a martyr two times. A martyr two times. A martyr. Now we think it's tough here if he got to get killed two times. So there are exceptions to the rule, aren't there? We see some exceptions to the rule. And here we have miraculous births. How many miraculous births were there in the Bible? Can you name? I won't have you name all of them. But how many miraculous births were there in the Bible? John would be one, right? Who? John would be one of them. John the Baptist, yes. Mm -hmm. How about in the Old Testament? Jesus, Isaac. Isaac was a miraculous birth. Mm -hmm. Who else? Would Samuel be one also? Samuel was one also. Thank you. A plus. Not Moses, really. Who? Uh, Moses wasn't, but he was special in that he was saved he was from. Spared, yeah. He was spared miraculously, and he just think about Moses for a while. They Pharaoh wanted to kill all the Hebrew boys, but God laughed the last laugh, and he not only brought forth this Hebrew boy, but Pharaoh paid for his raising yeah. and for his education and paid his mother to nurse him for probably at least five to seven years. By the way, the movie, you know, Exodus with Cecil B. DeMille, he didn't quite read the Bible just exactly right. Moses knew who his mother and father were. He knew all his aunts and uncles. He was raised there. He would go to the palace, but he would go home and be with his mother and father and brother and sister. Moses had a lot of names, not just Moshe. He had a lot of names, didn't he? His mother gave him a name. His father gave him a name. Aaron gave him a name. Miriam gave him a name. His uncles gave him a name. His aunts gave him a name. He had a whole bunch of names. You go back and look up Mo the names of Moses, one of the sermons that I have done a long time ago, probably six or seven years ago. A lot of miraculous births in the Bible, aren't there? A lot of miraculous births in the New Testament. Well, Re what, did Rebecca, when she had a child, was that a miraculous birth? Mm -hmm. Yes, in all reality. How about Re uh, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Rachel and Rebecca. All that. Samuel. All of these are miraculous births. They're not just one. But there's only one that was born of God with the blood of God in him instead of the blood of Adam in him, and that's Jesus Christ. We have Paul struck down by God. God overruled his volition, didn't he? We see that exception to the rule. Exceptions to the rule. We have a lot of exceptions to the rule in the Bible. The rule is that every man has volition and that he will believe or not 
believe, and it is his own fault whether he is a child of God or not, but it's by the Spirit of God that we are all convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment that come. Now, Gabriel is real busy. I don't want to name this. Exceptions to the rule or Gabriel is real busy. Because Gabriel is real busy in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. He's standing on the right hand of the altar of God over there, the altar of incense in verse number 11. Zechariah is unable to speak for the exception of that rule. He is left to go ahead and finish his course of duty. And then, in verse number 26, Gabriel announces Christ's birth. And this is the miraculous birth, the most miraculous birth. Because this one here is a son of woman, a son of the human race, but without sin because the seed or the seed of this woman is there, but the seed of Adam is not there. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth. Root, Nazareth. Now, Elizabeth hid herself for how long? Five months. Five months. Except for Mary, Mar Mary Romero, every woman that's usually four or five months pregnant, you can tell they're pregnant about that period of time. Mary, you never knew she was pregnant until about the eighth month for some reason. I don't know why she just didn't show her pregnancies. But most women began to show their pregnancy. If you want to see somebody really pregnant, you come out there with my daughter's dog. dog. She looks like three cows. He's really big. Well, Martha hid herself for five months and all of a sudden walked out there like this. Look at me. God has spared my shame. Now I'm pregnant. I'm going to have a baby. I'm forgiven or whatever happened. You know, they thought that if a woman didn't get pregnant right off the bat when she's married, that something was wrong, that God was uh, chastising her. Sarah told Abraham that God was chastising him. You just go over there and, and fool around with Hagar a little bit and see you're not doing so well. Well... God says, yes, he's doing fine. It's you, old girl. <laughs> and she got mad, didn't she? Sarah means what, Brother Ray? Sarah means contentious. She started contending and fighting, ready to fight. Let's go on a little further now. Verse 27, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. Now, the word virgin there is uh, parthenos. That means virgin. Now, there's two words used in the Bible in the Hebrew for virgin. One of them is a virgin, one of them is not. Isaiah 7 and 14, they talked about, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child. His name shall be Emmanuel. That's a duel prophecy. The first time... The Hebrew word there is Alma. Alma. I won't write it in Hebrew. But there it is in English. Alma. The word Alma, Mar Marilyn, you remember what the word Alma means? A woman that's sexually mature. That's all it means. That she's a woman. A sexually mature woman. Alma. It doesn't mean virgin. Now that woman there in Isaiah had a child and they called his name Emmanuel and certain things happened in his lifetime and it tells you there. I won't go into all of that. But then the second fulfillment of that was totally different because the Jews understood that this seed of the woman, not that prophecy right there, but the future prophecy was a seed of a real uh, woman and she would be a virgin. 
And in the Greek, Septuagint, it uses the word parthenos. And it doesn't use the word made. It uses the word parthenos. This is the word, alma means made, except it means sexually mature made. She can have a child. The word parthenos or Bethula. Bethula. That's a different word. Bethula. Bethula. Now when Gesenius made the difference between these, they tried to laugh him out, tried to push him out of the theological, as a theological expert, because he told them there, Isaiah 7.14 did not mean virgin, but made. And then since that time, now everybody says that that's what it means, except for those with King Jim only. Because it says Alma, not Bethula. But the second fulfillment of that, it was a Bethula. Bethula. Remember, Marilyn, do you remember what Bethula means? Bethula. Bethula. What? It means virgin, yes. Uh, Sharon, do you remember what that one means specifically? What does it draw out in that name, Bethula? Well, the Beth is that she, she's been in the house. And she's been she watched was. over by her father's house and make sure that she is a virgin. She's, the, she's been under the goggles of mama and daddy and brothers and sisters and everybody. She is definitely a virgin, okay? She has been watched. That's where the Bethula. That's a, what? The name Beth House. Oh, okay. She was not let out of the house. She's been watched. The word Beth is in that word. Bethula. Are you learning something tonight? A little bit of hope. Now, verse 27, it says a virgin. In some translations, it will say a maid. And I think it says a maid. And, uh, I can find it. Twenty. It says in verse twenty-seven in the Amplified, "To a girl never having been married, a virgin engaged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph." a descendant of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. She was a virgin. Now, some of the later translations, the liberal translations, I might say, many people say that the author, or the um, American Standard Version, New American Standard, liberal translations, no, they're very conservative. They're very conservative translations. But some of the liberal translations will say that this was a young woman only, but it says in Greek that she's a Parthenos, that she is a Bethula, a real virgin. And it was very important because Joseph had not had anything to do with her yet. Even though she was engaged to him and a legal contract was made, she had not come to live in or to be in his bed, so to speak, her bed. It's always called the woman's bed not the man's bed. It's the woman's bed. So was she considered a handmaiden? Uh, no. She's, she's an a engaged woman. Okay. She's engaged. But she has not, he, uh, Joseph has not been to her bed yet. That's what it really means. To a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. Joseph means what? Success and increase, always. Every time Joseph in the Old Testament, every time that adversity hit him, God would give him success, wouldn't he? And that's what his name meant, success. Increase. Of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at his statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now just think about for a while. 
Carol, just imagine that you lived uh, 2,000 years ago and an angel came to you and you knew what Genesis 3.15 said that, that a virgin would that the woman, the seed of the woman would bring forth a Messiah and that would be the savior of the world just imagine that Gabriel appears to you and says you're the one you're the one you're, him, you're her you are the one that's going to save the world you are the one that the seed of you, the seed of the woman, shall save the whole world. What a, an explanation. She probably would be in shock, do you think? I'm the one? Me? She was greatly troubled at statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jehovah Saves. Yahshua. His name was Yahshua. By the way, who led Israel into the promised land? Joshua. Joshua. Who will lead us into heaven? Yahshua. And bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. Isaiah 7, 14. Jehovah saves as Emmanuel, God with us. The fulfillment, the final fulfillment of Isaiah 7, 14. And he will be great and will be called the son, the wheels of the most high God. El Elyon, it is in Hebrew, of the Most High God, El Elyon. The Most High God, the Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, will give him the throne of his father David. And he will be great and be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. Think about that. Say it over and over and over again in your mind. Why will he have the throne of his father David? What are the two promises in the Old Testament, unconditional covenants in the Old Testament, to which will cause this to be a reality? The Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant. This is fulfilling both of those. Now verse number 33. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. Now, pay attention. Lights come on. He will raise, rule over the house of Jacob. Who was ruling over the house of Jacob today, that day? Herod, which was Esau's descendant, not Jacob's descendant. So why do you think they used the name Jacob? Jacob. Herod was a king of Israel, wasn't he? But it should have been Joseph on the throne. He was in line for the throne. Now let's go to the Greek. From here on. Gabriel's really busy. A pan de marium. Pros ton angelon. Pos esti tuto epe andra u genosco. Now, I want you to remember everything that we said before. Luke was an expert witness in medical science, chemistry, mathematics, natural science, physicist, and a scientist, and a doctor. So our report that Luke writes down here is extremely accurate, and he goes into every detail about it, every detail. Now let's see what he says. He says that Mary was a virgin, didn't he? He says that, that Elizabeth was beyond childbearing age. She was advanced. So this is a miraculous birth. Luke leaves Zechariah. Remember his name is Zechariah. He leaves Zechariah in service because he didn't, God didn't strike him down 
but it but revealed something to him. This is going to be the uh, Eliezer. Eliezer was Abraham's servant, and the A Eliezer. Abraham told God that he, the Azer, is my heir. He is born in my house. Mm -hmm. And Eliezer was very important in the Old Testament because he was the friend of the bridegroom, wasn't he? The friend of the bridegroom. He was the one that Abraham sent to go and get Isaac a wife. Ab uh, Eliezer didn't get anything out of it except to know that he was doing his master's will. John the Baptist will be least in the kingdom of God, yet he was the greatest prophet, wasn't he? Why? Because he was foreordained and predestined. Just think about that for just a minute. If everybody was foreordained and predestined, absolutely beyond their will, it would be just like John the Baptist, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Least in the kingdom of God. Now, we're all predestined and foreordained, but within our volitionary rights. Mm -hmm. John the Baptist wasn't. Weak adversity conjunction day, and moreover, she said, or he said to Mary, or she, Mary said to the angel, the angelos, what is the word angel? And who is this guy? This is Gabriel. He's a, we think that he's an archangel, and he's over the informational realm. I heard you did a real good sermon Wednesday night. Sermonette. Sermonette. <laughs> On angels. Well, Gabriel is the archangel over the informational realm. Michael is the archangel over the spiritual realm, and Lucifer was the was the archangel over the material realm. Angelos, messenger. And how shall this be since a man, an Andhra, not I have known, or not I know. I don't know a man. I don't physically, I haven't experienced the uh, union of marriage. I haven't had this experience. How am I going to have a baby when I haven't had this experience with a man? Verse number 35. Kai apokrites, ho angelos, a pan alte, numa hogion, epi lucete, epi si kai dinamis, hypsos tu, Opis kai se, si dio kai ta genomenon, hagion, kleithesate, huios theu. And having answered, having caught up in speech the angel, he said to her, Spirit holy, Spirit holy, he shall come upon you. And the dynamis, the power, the regal power, the divine power, the majestic power of the Most High God, El Elyon, in the Hebrew, Hypsisto, in Greek, the power of the El Elyon, Most High God, he shall overshadow you, Wherefore also the one being born holy, he shall be holy. Jesus is without sin. He's holy. He's without sin. Holy. And he shall be called. Third person seeing your future in different indicative past. Even he shall be called Huyu Theu. Huyos Theu. What's wheels, Brother Ray? Huh? God. Wheels. Wheels. That means firstborn son. Mm -hmm. Firstborn son. Firstborn son. 
There's only one firstborn son. Did you know that? It's only one. There aren't but one. And that firstborn son of every beast in the field was holy to the Lord, wasn't it? Kadesh et Jehovah. Holy to the Lord. Every one of them. Every one calf, every bull, every horse, every donkey was holy unto the Lord. In other words, it belonged to the Lord because it was typifying one thing. His future son, and it would be only be one. The law said that every animal that opens the womb is holy to the Lord. It's the Lord's. Every one. Now, if that was a calf, the first calf that was born, what what they have to do with this calf, brother? Right? Something they would dedicate to the Lord. Huh? Dedicate it to the Lord. They had to take it and sacrifice it to the Lord. When it was a year old. Now, let's think about this for a minute. We talked about giving here a while back, didn't we? Giving is a very important thing. That is an attribute of being born again. You're giving it. But now, you're going to be a cattle farmer, Brother Ray. And you got 50 cows out there in the field, and you got about five bulls and 50 cows. And all of these cows are heifers, so to speak. What is a heifer? It's a young cow. And are all heifers. They're heifers until they're cows, until they've given birth to one child or one calf. Now, every one of these 50 cows that gives birth, you've got to take that calf and you've got to sacrifice it to the Lord. Every one of them. All of them. You don't get to keep one? No one? You get to feed them for a year. Now just think about this. You go and buy a farm, Brother Vincent, a ranch, and you have 50 cows. And under the law, those 50 cows all get pregnant. You get to feed all of those 50 cows for all the time they're in gestation period. And then you get to feed those calves until they're one year old. And then every one of those calves has to be honored to the Lord and given to him because it's mine. That's mine. Think about that. Every one of them. That's not real good business, is it? Yeah. You got to wean all of them, and then the next time they get pregnant, you get to keep them. But God says next time maybe she'll have two instead of one. And I'll pay you because you got to believe in God that God will. You got to trust God that God is going to take care of you. The idea is to buy five of them cows or ten of those cows that has already had a calf. <laughs> you get to keep some of them. But it does. Do you trust God when you give? We have to. We have to trust God when we give. It wouldn't be rational. I know this guy is an ex-Mormon. And I asked him, he said, no, I'm not a Mormon anymore. Because I don't give the church. He said, I don't have to go to church, and I don't have to, I get to keep all 100% of what I make now. Because they come and collect it. If you're a Mormon in good standing, you've got to give that 10% that time. Trusting the Lord. Now, that's not a legitimate religion. But in God's religion, we still have to trust God, don't we? We could use every dime that we get, don't we? Can't we? Most of us. But by faith, we give the tithe to God, and God will give us the increase. And does he answer that prayer? Does he keep that promise to you? Does he keep it? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the angel having announced, he said to her, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, Ruah Elohim, in Hebrew, shall come upon you, Epi Erkamai upon you and the power of El Elyon, the Most High God, 
he shall oversaddle you. Wherefore also the one being born, he's holy. Not of earth. Not of the blood of Adam. This is the promise, Genesis 3.15. Luke is making it very plain. And he shall be called the wheels. God only has one son. He only had one. He could only have one heir and one son. That's staying in there. It's neuter. Which shall be born of you shall be called wheels to you. Son of God. Exodus 40, 34, Isaiah 7, 14. Genesis 3:15. Verse number 36. <clears throat> and behold, oh, I'm translating it in my head. Kai Edu. Elizabeth. Hey, see me again, See, Kai Alte. See, El Lethane. Fane, that is. Quion. En Gere. Alte. Kai Hutos. Men Hectos. Esti. Alte. Te. Kalumene. Stera. Luke is using all kinds of medical terms here. And behold, Elizabeth. God keeps his word. That's what Elizabeth means, isn't it? God keeps his word. The relative belonging to you, Sinai Genes, actually the relative of uh, one born together in, that, in your generation, okay? Your relative in your generation, we're not talking about Isaiah 7.14 now. We're not talking about Genesis 3.15 in that generation. We're talking about your specific generation. In the generation of you, also she has conceived. Perfect indicative active, third person singular. She has conceived a way we own. And by the way, this is the heir. And this heir should have been called Zechariah. Huh? But God named him special. She has conceived a son, an heir, in old age, a geri. We got our word geriatric. Have you, any of you, feel geriatric today? I feel overly geriatric today. She's geriatric. In the old age and her geriatric age of her, and this one, uh, this woman, she's in the, uh, and this child is in the sixth month now. John the Baptist, six months older than Jesus. He is with her in the being called barren, the one being called a stera. Stera. What's stera mean? You remember what stera means, Sharon? Stera. It means stiff. That her womb was dried up and stiff. What, Marilyn? Oh, no, no, stera, not Sarah, stera. We get a word steroids from this oh, word, steroids. okay? And steroids are something that makes you muscly. People take steroids and they get big muscles and stiff and, and powerful muscles. That word is a medical term. It's still a medical term, stera. Stiff, hard, dried out. Her womb is dried out. She's done. No more menstrual cycles, nothing. She was finished. They all knew that, didn't they? It was a shame to her. But God turned the shame around. And it became a blessing. Let's read that 36 and amplify and see what they say there. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth, who has conceived a son in her old age, and she was called barren, is now in her sixth month. She was dried up, a dried up old prune. Dried out, 
That's what that word stara means. Verse number 37. Hote uk idena tese para tu theu pan rema. Because not it, it is impossible with the God every word. When God declares something, that something is just as sure as the existence of God. That declaration is as sure as there is a God. He swears that it shall happen, and he promises that it shall happen, and it shall happen. Every little detail. The seed of the woman. The woman shall bring forth a son, and without sin, and this will be the Christ child, not Canaan, not Canaan, or Canaan, or Cain. This one here is going to be successful at being the Messiah. Cain was a absolute flop, wasn't he? He was a murderer. The murdering Messiah. God swears that these things shall happen. 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. Every word shall be fulfilled. Genesis 18 and 14 and Jeremiah 32 and 17. The last verse, verse number 38. Now, Luke is a classical Greek writer. High Greek, polished Greek, classical and koine. High koine and classical. There is eight cases in koine and classical. Nominative, genitive, obdative, locative, instrumental, dative, accusative, and vocative. They try to, and to, to, today in Greek, modern Greek, it's two cases. Subject, object, nominative, and accusative, basically. That's all they have. But back then, it was eight cases in this polished, beautiful Greek. Eight cases. And the, the, the verbs and the modes are very important. And in this verse number 38 here, we have the optative mode. The mode of hopeful affirmation. It's very rare in the New Testament. It is not rare in Koine and Classical. But in the New Testament, it's rare. But here, Luke uses it in his high, polished language. A pen de marium. Idu he dule. Curio genotoi. Genoto, that is. Moi kara to rema. Su kai apelthane op altes ho angelos. Moreover, furthermore, Mary, she said, now Mary means what? Bitter, sad, remorsed. That's what Mary means. Now, let me say this to you also that you that you know I teach everything under the sun. I teach eclectic religions and I teach uh, cults and isms and everything. And one of the the, the most powerful religion in the world today, uh, worldly that is, is Islam. And Muhammad uh, listened a lot. They called him big ears back in his day because he listened to stories. And he went off down into Syria and Damascus especially and he heard the word of the Lord down there preached by preachers and heretics too. And of course, he had a real close friend by the name of Said. And Said said that he believed that there was a religion purer than anything that went all the way back to Abraham. And that's what Muhammad caught up on. He became a propagator of Saidism. Well, when he went down to Syria down to Damascus he heard the Bible stories and there are the Quran is extremely repetitive it talks a lot about Moses talks a lot about Pharaoh talks about Joseph 
and some of the characters back there and just it absolutely ignores but but Muhammad had no biblical chronology at all what took place here and what took place here or what took place here he did not differentiate between any of that at all and Moses had a sister by the name of Miriam and when Muhammad started writing about Miriam, Jesus' mother, which is the same name, he got her confused with Moses' sister and got her confused that her father was the father of Miriam, the father of Moses, and her, her mother was Jochebed and all of this. He got them all mixed up, and he thought that Mary in the New Testament was actually the same person as Miriam in the Old Testament. I just thought I'd bring that out to you. Get your chronology. The reason why I have this chart up in front of me for, for how many years, Ray? 45 years, I guess. Is to get you to understand what part of time we're talking about. And said to Mary, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord. May it become to me according to the word, the rhema. Look at that word rhema there to the edicts, the declaration, the flowing statement is what it literally means, comes from Rayo. The word of you, and he left from her the angel. He left her, this angel left her. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. It was done. Now what happened later? The Holy Spirit came upon her just like it. The Holy Spirit and the God, the Most High God, El, El Elyon came upon her and that child that was born of her was of God. The Son of God. The Son of God. Now this is not a story. This is the fact, a historical fact. And I, I preached a set of messages one time, the external evidence of the, the birth and the prophecies, the life, the miraculous ministry, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's more, there's more written about him in history than there is in the Bible. But Luke says that this is, he is an expert witness and that this is the facts, just the facts, just the facts as they were. He's an expert witness. He's a court-called expert witness. And he is telling us the things as they happened. And he wanted to make sure that we understood that Elizabeth was barren, that Mary was a virgin, and that she had not known a man, and that the spirit of the Most High God would, would overshadow her, and Genesis 3.15 would be fulfilled. And he wrote it in high, polished Greek. And we went all the way from 1.1, one, one, didn't we, to 1.38. Do you have any questions? Brother... Vincent, what song do we have of invitation? We have uh, 551. 551. Now, if you're out there and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, why are you rejecting him? Is there any reason why that you would not ask the Lord to forgive you and save you right now at this moment? Is there any reason why? And if you're, ser you're, you're saved, you ought to be trying to serve the Lord the best way you can. If you can't go to church, you ought to give anyway. You ought to do something for God. You ought to show that you love Him and you appreciate Him. Brother Vincent. Closer, drawn to thee. 
Is God drawing you out there? Is he drawing you to him? Closer walk with him? Is it growing to you for salvation? Our Heavenly Father, we send this message out for your honor, for your glory. I pray that it touches people's lives, that they will believe, that they will serve you, let their lives honor you in the way they can. Father, we send the message out, and we know that your spirit will go with it and seek and draw people unto you. In Jesus' name we pray, and forgive me where I fail you. In my Savior's name I pray, amen.